I'm David Hilborn. I'm the principal of Morelands College. I'm here today at Morelands. This is my uh, study. And um, thank you very much for logging into this ELF workshop on a very sensitive and challenging topic. And I'm going to make no bounds about the fact that some of the ideas that uh, I uh, examine and critique uh, this afternoon are really tough to uh, get your head around and also just tough from a ethical point of view, from a classical Christian point of view to absorb. Um, but thank you for logging in. I'm uh, presuming that you are already uh, interested enough in the topic to uh, take this seminar on board. So um, I'm going to start just by um, something that would be fairly familiar, I guess, to all of us, which is the uh, sometimes called the alphabet soup of um, gender identity. Gender identity is a big um, topic in cultural discourse in the 21st century, particularly in the West. And you will be familiar, many of you, with the LGBTIQ spectrum, and you have to add a plus and many more letters to that in some settings. But the Q is what I'm interested in this afternoon in that spectrum. It's related to the other identities of lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender, intersex, and so forth, but it has a very particular meaning. The uh, first use in English recorded is about 1513 of this word queer, in which it meant unusual or odd or peculiar, and it's still used that way today. People talk about counterfeit money as queer money, uh, or they talk about feeling queer if they're sick. But in the Oxford English Dictionary, the first use of queer to define a sexual identity is by the Marquis of Queensbury in 1894, when he uses it as a term to describe uh, homosexuals as they were then known. And later, around about 1914, around the First World War, there are hints of the term not just being used in a derogatory way, being appropriated by certain groups uh, from within as a descriptor of their own identity, particularly of the homosexual community, what would now be known as the lesbian and gay male community. And then in the early 1990s is where we see the uh, full on appropriation of this term queer by people who don't conform to uh, gender norms or um, the norms of uh, sexual identity within society, people who are on this uh, spectrum of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and so forth. And in academic circles, um, the, the term is beginning to be used at conferences and in multi-author volumes of scholarly literature around about 1990. Gloria Anthaluda, who was uh, and is a, um, a, a philosopher, began to use the term in the 80s, but the first queer theory conference, and um, we must uh, separate queer theory from queer theology, queer theory as a secular discipline was held in 1990 under the aegis of Teresa Dalloratis. And then subsequently figures like Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick and Michael Warner and Judith Butler, of whom more later, uh, begin to take on board the ideas that are defined by so-called queer theory and put them into the uh, mainstream. So what is indeed queer theory? Well, Jay Stewart defines it quite succinctly in this uh, multi-author volume, Non-Binary Genders, uh, published in 2017. In this way, he talks of queer theory and politics necessarily celebrating transgression. And of course, that's in relation to sexuality and gender identity. Um, and also as challenging norms. Those two things go together quite closely, of course. Um, and seeing culturally constructed norms of sexuality being the focus of its attention rather than something construed as natural or inevitable from biology. Indeed, queer theory differs from previous iterations of um, sexual politics and sexual philosophies in that it is very focused on the interrogation of assumed biological norms within the arena of sexuality. And we'll see how that developed in history uh, up to the present in a moment. But queer theology as a discipline within the Christian tradition, particularly, but in other religious traditions as well, is a 
uh, kind of expression of alignment to some of those uh, emphases, the social construction of uh, gender, the um, interrogation of norms around sexuality, and the assumption that uh, it is good to challenge these norms. Uh, Susanna Cornwall is right to remind us in, his, in, in her book, uh, Controversies in Queer Theology, that uh, queer theology can't be understood as a single monolithic group. It builds on what is already a very diverse and diffuse school of thought known as uh, queer theory. Uh, Patrick Cheng agrees with her in his book, uh, Radical Love, which is an introduction to queer theology. And he says that um, queer, as opposed to the terms sort of lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, and so forth, explicitly signals the marginality and otherness of those sexual identities and says that it's an umbrella term for them. Um, queer theology, as he applies it to, in his case, the Judeo-Christian tradition, he says, therefore, is theology done by and on behalf of those who inhabit that LGBTQI plus spectrum. But also, it's not just that it's theology done by LGBTQI folk. It has a very particular kind of uh, provenance and a very particular kind of substance to it, although it is quite diverse. So let's dig into the epistemology, the kind of um, philosophical foundations of how queer theology expects to know God and expects to understand its own uh, traditions of religious practice. So Lisa Isherwood is one of the leading figures within queer theology in Britain and indeed internationally. She is a lecturer at the University of Winchester, just actually up the road from here a few miles, uh, where we are in Christchurch in Dorset in the UK at Moorlands. And she, uh, in an article for uh, the Cambridge Dictionary of Christian Theology, uh, very, very concisely defines uh, queer theology as founded on a constructionist epistemology, uh, a constructionist understanding of how we know the world and how we know God, rather than an essentialist uh, understanding where through our innate humanity or perhaps something that is uh, given from on high through revelation, and implanted in us in our essential nature. We know the world, she says, through constructing culture and constructing sexuality and constructing uh, identity um, rather than it being uh, given to us or it being innate necessarily within biology. As a result of that construction of identity through sex and through gender, and we'll come to the distinction of sex and gender in a minute, um, she, uh, she endorses a pluralist approach to sexual ethics and sexual practice. So there is obviously a, a kind of uh, a fluidity and a diversity uh, around that. And indeed, she says that in terms of identification, uh, sexuality and gender are both ambivalent and fluid. They can be morphed from A to B. They can be altered. They can be reconstructed through the human will. And this is very different, of course, uh, as we'll see from uh, the uh, classic uh, Christian understanding. In this book, Lynn Marie Tonstad, called Queer Theology, talks of uh, one of the key elements of both queer theory and queer theology as what is called critiquing heteronormativity. Now, if you haven't heard that word before, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, essentially it is the notion that is very familiar, of course, from traditional Christianity of there uh, being two sexes that are biologically uh, innate and are determined by God's creation of human beings in his own image, male and female created through them in Genesis chapter one. But uh, in terms of Tonstadt's analysis, um, heteronormativity is to be critiqued. That version of how we uh, are constructed by God, how our identity is formed innately through biology, that needs to be critiqued. Uh, and uh, heteronormativity is the idea that it's wedded to uh, binary understanding uh, in which male and female uh, is the default and uh, in which uh, procreation, reproduction uh, out of heterosexual marriage uh, is the default. 
So as you can see in that definition, um, heteronormativity is uh, the naturalization of the socio-political system of heterosexuality within a patriarchy. That is all bound up uh, as uh, queer theorists and queer theologians tend to say with the idea of the innate superiority or at least the hierarchical uh, uh, authority of the male uh, over the female. This is how queer theory and queer theology and all their diversity tend nonetheless to go. These are some of the common features. Now it goes without saying that they are obviously a challenge to what I'm going to call classic Christian and classic evangelical approaches to sexuality. By using that term classic Christian, I'm uh, alluding to Thomas Oden's definition of classic Christianity as consensual ecumenical teaching that's self-consciously rooted in scripture, apostolic and patristic doctrine, and is held as central and foundational across Catholic, Orthodox, Evangelical, Charismatic and mainline Protestant traditions. Now, I'm acutely aware, particularly in this space, that um, uh, we would want to be very distinctively defining ourselves as evangelical within that much broader spectrum. But it's nonetheless the case that on matters of sexual ethics, uh, evangelical Christians have often made common cause, and also around abortion and euthanasia, life and death issues as well, with those other traditions. And so Odin quite usefully uses that term, classic Christianity, to uh, describe orthodox Christian traditions or creedal Christian traditions that have at least um, a recognition of the importance of the authority uh, of scripture around uh, matters of uh, sexuality. But nonetheless, to be more specific, and I do want to be more specific than that, while evangelicals might make common cause with those other traditions in uh, statements like the Manhattan Declaration uh, around sexual uh, ethics and uh, the integrity of uh, monogamous heterosexual marriage and the like, there is nonetheless a distinctive uh, evangelical tradition derived from the Protestant Reformation, uh, given vibrancy through the great revivals of the 18th century and fueled by Pentecostal and charismatic spiritualities in, this, in the 20th, which places scripture as the prime authority for faith and conduct and which is committed to the new birth of a Christian uh, in conversion and a focus on Christ's saving work on the cross issuing then in transformative evangelism and uh, mission to impact the church and the world. And the classic tradition of evangelicalism, deriving its heritage through those sources and with those theological emphases is obviously a tradition that is wedded to uh, traditional understandings through uh, scriptures which we'll explore in a moment uh, of marriage as God's best and God's norm and God's default and God's only context for uh, sexual uh, intercourse and sexual expression, along with chaste singleness. But that classic evangelical tradition has come under pressure from groups even within its own orbit historically that have begun to be influenced by uh, queer theology and also, of course, theologies which affirm at same-sex marriage and the like. And this movement within evangelicalism is variously labeled, but it's known in the UK in my context as affirming or accepting or including evangelicalism, depending on which theologian you read. And uh, examples of this movement of folk who want to call themselves evangelical, but are influenced more by those more radical and liberal theologies around sexuality, would include uh, James Brownson and Mark Actemeyer and Matthew Vines um, in the UK context, Steve Chalk, Tony Campolo, many of you will be familiar with, Jen Hatmaker, Vicky Beeching, and Jane Ozan. And whilst not all of them will be erudite and well-read in queer theology, uh, even if only implicitly, it has influenced their understanding of sexual ethics and sexual practice. So it's really important, I think, that as evangelicals in that classic evangelical tradition, we uh, understand this uh, latest challenge around sexual ethics and the theology of sexuality, uh, which is known as queer theology. So let's just establish how we are coming at this. And I'm going to take as my key reference points, 
um, different reports published by the Evangelical Alliance in the UK, uh, some of which I uh, had uh, a hand in. So there's the Faith, Hope and Homosexuality Report of 1998, the Biblical and Pastoral Responses to Homosexuality Report from 2012, and then from 2000, a report on what was then known as transsexuality, and much more recently in 2018, a uh, report called Transformed on Transgender Identities. Now, in the uh, original 1998 report, uh, marriage is defined there as an exclusive relationship for life between one man and one woman, and the only form of partnership approved by God for sexual relations today. And that's backed up in the subsequent uh, report on biblical and pastoral responses to homosexuality. But the particular issues of transsexual identity as they were then known and transgender uh, identities more familiarly as they're called today were addressed in those two reports on the right uh, in 2000 and 2018. So I'm just going to quote from each of those and you'll see there that um, in the 2000 report on uh, transsexuality the uh, movement within society of people who believe Variously, they're born in the wrong body and wish to undergo gender trans, uh, 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 gender reassignment surgery or uh, undergo gender transition through uh, pharmaceutical means, but not necessarily surgical means, uh, or just simply are engaged in um, uh, display of transvestitism and so forth. And um, that word could cover all those uh, issues then, although more generally the, uh, the, the reassignment and surgical reassignment uh, case. And it says there in that EA report, God creates human beings as either male or female. Authentic change from the person's given sex is not possible. And an ongoing transgender lifestyle, transsexual lifestyle is incompatible with God's will as revealed in scripture and in creation. In the more recent report of 2018, again, there's an assertion of two distinct and compatible biological sexes based on Genesis 1, 26 and 7. And then on Jesus' reaffirmation of that teaching in Matthew chapter 19, um, and also, of course, uh, the uh, reaffirmation of that by Paul in Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1 and so forth. And it goes on to speak about cross-gender identification as a concern because it distorts that creational order of male and female. Gender dysphoria, the sense that somebody is born in the wrong body, is understood as a result in the report there of living in a fallen world, not as a result of personal moral choice. So it's something to be viewed as part and parcel of a fractured and imperfect creation and with compassion in many cases, as folk like Mark Yarhouse has written uh, in his work on uh, transgender people. But nonetheless, theologically, uh, it's construed as um, uh, falling short of God's uh, ideal for or human beings and human relating. Now, when we try to uh, relate these uh, differences of opinion between classic evangelical and queer theological constraints of sex and gender, it's very important to understand that it's pretty fundamental, uh, the difference around biblical hermeneutics, the uh, theology of interpretation of scripture. So within that Protestant Reformation root of evangelicalism, there is a sense of uh, focus for Martin Luther on what's called sometimes the claritas scriptura, the clarity of scripture. The idea that scripture has been given by God as a lamp and light to humanity, Psalm 119, 105, and it can never be so obscure that only elite academies and magisteria can interpret it correctly. So more particularly also for John Calvin, uh, there is access through scripture to the mens out Taurus, the mind of the author, the intention of the author, set in original context and being able to be read from the pages of scripture by the common people. And then later, William Sanford Lesor notes that that method, that reformation method of interpretation based on original context, on the intent of the author and on the setting of the text uh, can be... Uh, kind of uh, narrated into a, a theology of census plenior or the fuller sense of scripture, which connects scripture together, sees it as an integrated whole uh, so that we can talk 
with integrity about gospel teaching or biblical doctrine uh, without that being something that is uh, you know, an impossible dream that is just an abstraction. It's real because scripture is God-given, God-breathed, and has that uh, integrity, that infallible, inerrant quality that, of course, we affirm as classic evangelicals. And then also, um, as we move into the more modern disciplines of uh, biblical hermeneutics, uh, specifically, the exegesis of the text in its original context is wedded to the contextualization of the text in our present day, in present culture. So for Anthony Thistleton or Grant Osborne in their uh, magisterial books on evangelical biblical hermeneutics, um, that uh, dyadic depiction of the male-female relationship in Genesis 1, 26 and 7 picked up in Jesus' teaching on marriage in Matthew 19 and also uh, as I say in Romans 1 and elsewhere in uh, Ephesians 5, for example, um, is a line of continuity which is contextualized, yes, to different cultural expressions of family life, some extended, some nuclear, um, and which can assimilate in the New Testament a positive theology of singleness in 1 Corinthians 7, for example, uh, where there is a recognition of singleness as a positive contributor to discipleship within the wider church. And then also uh, in Jesus's teaching, as we'll see, a commendation of uh, eunuchs uh, interpreted in three different ways in Matthew's gospel. So to sum up um, in terms of the approach to scripture and also humanity, in the classic evangelical tradition, there it tends to be a focus on essentialism, what is given by God and what is innate in biology around that binary relation of male and female, uh, around the binary relation of uh, XX chromosomes for women and XY chromosomes for men, which is seen as a corollary of that binarity uh, in many evangelical understandings of uh, biology and of uh, sexual relationship. Um, so there is binarity and it is taken to be the default, the norm, and that uh, sexuality is given, it's determined, there's a determinacy about it. But over in queer theory and queer theology, as we've seen, there's a focus on the construction of sexuality through the human will or human intent. Um, there's a focus on plurality and fluidity of sexual identities. People can change from uh, heterosexual into transgender, from transgender into polygender, and back to transgender, and the lines can go uh, different ways because no longer is there an understanding of what is given and innate. There is an understanding of what can be narrated by the human uh, psyche, can be uh, constructed uh, by uh, humans either collectively or individually within the cultural space. And thereby sexuality is de deemed to be indeterminate, something that is open, something that is uh, un finalized. So yeah, just that, that contrast between the classical evangelical focus on essentialism, binarity and determinacy, and queer theological foci on constructionism, plurality, and indeterminacy. Um, now we get into some of the exemplification of this uh, with some queer theologians who have been uh, kind of at the forefront uh, of that movement now. And one of the key uh, figures is uh, Marcella althaus Reed. Uh, South uh, American uh, pioneer, as I say, of queer theology, um, who in an article actually, weirdly enough, uh, for the IVP New Dictionary of Theology, um, talks of uh, queer theology in these terms. Um, she says how it's building on feminist criticism of patriarchy, so what's known as uh, second wave feminism, making the distinction between sex as biologically given and gender as culturally constructed. Um, so in uh, feminism, to typically there's an acceptance of certain biological traits that women have around childbirth, uh, susceptibility to rape at much higher levels than men and so forth and so on. Um, but it goes beyond that particular distinction that uh, feminists want to make between um, the things that women biologically are um, uh, destined to do and how women are presented in culture, um, not necessarily as um, homemakers, 
not necessarily as uh, child rearers. Um, uh, 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 and you'll know the story from the uh, 1960s onwards, Betty Friedan, Jermaine Greer, um, uh, and, and so forth, questioning uh, the social construction of womanhood um, and the social norms of womanhood. So in terms of the radical questioning of those norms, Mar uh, Martella Althaus reed says that uh, queer uh, theory is a common uh, kind of partner to that. But there is more going on in queer theory and particularly queer theology as she uh, deems it than just that, because she talks in that article and other work that she's published about the deconstruction of perceived homogeneity of all heterosexual and non-heterosexual identities as deceptive. So there is no stability anywhere, even ultimately around the question of sex. And as we'll see, that distinction between sex and gender begins to dissolve in queer theology and queer theory. Now, there are particular progenitors philosophically of this tradition, and it's worth whilst noting the headlines and the key features, just tracking back a little to see where all this is coming from within European culture. So we are the European Leadership Forum, and in a lot of the explanations of uh, how we understand where we are missionally in the 21st century, there's a focus on the Enlightenment, that turn to the subject, that turn to reason uh, around the 18th century, uh, which uh, puts the self at the center and the human thinking mind as um, trumping uh, revelation and uh, divine disclosure as sources of truth. But I want to say that where it comes to queer theology, we're looking at a slightly different proven provenance. At the end, if you like, of that enlightenment project, uh, there are voices that begin to question the stability of uh, human reason and the linearity of the human mind in terms of reasoning uh, its way through to explanations that might do without God. So two key figures for queer theology uh, in the background, uh, as well as for queer theory, are Sigmund Freud and um, also Friedrich Nietzsche. Let's begin with uh, Nietzsche. So in his book, Beyond Good and Evil, and then later in the work of 1887, The Genealogy of Morals, uh, Nietzsche regards uh, Christianity, the Christian tradition, as distorting a true understanding of uh, sexuality. And that's one facet of what he calls the will to power. Um, he focuses on the innate drive of the strong to um, assert their independence and their authority within society, not least through um, sexuality. And sexuality is something for him that is part and parcel of realizing one's position as either strong or weak. And he says that both in the more elite areas of society, uh, in the aristocracy, for example, and nobility, and uh, in the monarchies of the world, there is a lot of sexual promiscuity. The genealogy of morals is trying to explain the evolution of morality. There is also a lot of sexual promiscuity among the working classes, um, but it is Christianity um, giving birth to a more um, often middle-class sensibility or decorous sensibility around sex, which builds on what he calls resentment. Resentment upwards and resentment downwards. Resentment of the sexual license of the moneyed elite and also of ordinary common people who need to be educated into uh, propriety around sexual ethics. Now, that's an extreme simplification of uh, Nietzsche's understanding. But basically, the uh, drives that he sees as natural, that he equates to um, creatures within the animal kingdom who have power, whether it's vultures or you know, the, the leader of a, a pack of bonobos or whatever it might be, um, that they are closer to our own instincts than we have come to perceive through the Judeo-Christian lens, which restrains and represses and trammels the, the natural will to power in sexuality of those who have realized themselves as humans. Now, within Freud, um, there's a different focus, obviously a medical doctor interested in uh, the mental distress uh, of uh, many of his patients, which he sourced within their sexual repression. 
and the attempts to check their libido, as he called it, um, those uh, drives of the unconscious, which are not controllable, not restrainable ultimately, and which can cause uh, tremendous psychological distress if not realized. And, and this, this, this focus of um, Nietzsche on the will to power in sexuality, self-actualization around natural drives, and uh, Freud's sense uh, of focus on the hidden drives of the libido, um, which have been restrained and repressed by uh, Judeo-Christian uh, mores, um, uncover a tradition which uh, really kind of flourishes in the sexual revolution of the 1960s. These figures come into their own with that, um, you know, that 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 moment within. Western society in which to some extent the advent of the contraceptive pill, but also the throwing off of the restraints of the Second World War of the baby boomer generation and all that goes with that, um, saw a kind of um, uh, an efflorescence of these ideas uh, in uh, the wider culture. And one of the key kind of figures who influences thinking around this sexual revolution and this much more um, a promiscuous and fluid approach to sexuality is Michel Foucault. And Michel Foucault is absolutely the core of understanding queer theory and queer theology. Because in line with um, those influences, although he's a critic of Freud in many ways, he nonetheless does pick up those, those emphases on uh, Nietzschean self-actualization around the will, around the construction of one's sexual power and identity within society and also the sense that there are these hidden drives that can only be repressed and uh, resented uh, long enough uh, for so long rather and so in uh, one of his um, essays he talks about there being nothing in man not even his body that is sufficiently stable to serve as the basis for self-recognition or for the understanding of other men and in uh, the work of Judith Butler, whom I mentioned earlier, particularly in her uh, groundbreaking study that almost all queer theorists refer back to of 1990, Gender Trouble, she also famously argues that because of this um, indeterminacy and fluidity and constructivist approach to the world, from all those sources I've mentioned, uh, the subject of women is no longer understood in stable or abiding turns. Um, independent of sex, gender, she says, becomes a free floating art artifice with a con uh, consequence that man and masculine might just as easily signify a female body as a male one. And you can see why she is the kind of high priest of transgenderism, that she is taken to be the major philosophical uh, influencer of the explosion of transgender identity, as you'll all be familiar with in the 21st century. Um, you know, seen empirically in the fact that referrals to a clinic in London here in the UK, the Tavistock Clinic, um, have increased over the last decade by hundreds of percent uh, as these influences from the academy have uh, pushed through into wider society and the um, LGBTQI plus spectrum has become much more a staple within the education system and within cultural discourse. But it gets even more radical than that because later in that same book, Gender Trouble, Butler dissolves the distinction between sex and gender. And if there's one takeaway that I would stress around um, our evangelical response to queer theology, it is that you have to understand that the distinction that is still taught widely between sex and gender, sex as biology, what is between your legs very crudely, and, and gender, which is what is in your head, that is blown apart by, by, by Butler. In her philosophy, even sex becomes constructed, even sex is fluid. The distinction, she says, between sex and gender turns out to be no distinction at all. And so everything is scripted and performed in culture. She uh, draws on the ordinary language philosopher J.L. Austin quite a lot. I think erroneously, I did my PhD 
uh, on Austin and theology. Um, and I, I do know a bit about J.L. Austin. I think she misconstrues him, but she takes this notion that um, language is an arena of performance rather than just of semantics. So when I say I pronounce you to be husband and wife as an Anglican minister, which I am, something is done in language. Language can reshape the world. Well, she takes that to an extreme and says that when a midwife pronounces it's a boy at a birth, she is performing a cultural script that's been kind of written for her through centuries of heteronormativity. And, um, you know, the fact that the child might have a penis or a vagina is only a minor detail because uh, obviously they could develop in a fluid and uh, a polymorphous way as they grow later in life. They could have gender reassignment surgery and so forth. So that biology does not determine uh, their identity. Sex is dissolved along with gender. Radical thinking, um, and it's important that you clock that. We can see corollaries of her philosophy in others who, along with Foucault, emerge in France uh, in the late 60s in what's known as post-structuralism. Um, so Roland Barthes speaks about the uh, way to approach texts um, and literary texts being one in which there is no fixture of meaning. There is only um, meaning, endlessly positing meaning, which liberates what he calls an anti-theological activity because to refuse to fix meaning is in the end to refuse God and his hypostases, um, his um, kind of uh, natures, if you like, reason, science, and law. Jacques Derrida uh, associated with that branch away from post-structuralism known as deconstruction speaks of the need to critique what he calls the transcendental signified. And he, all, he refers to that as the logos. Uh, he re rejects logocentrism, the idea that there is some exterior power or authority fixing meaning for us in language, a word above all words. And you can see that his critique of that metaphysic uh, is radically at odds with those uh, biblical norms that I have uh, shared with you around evangelical theology. So Althaus Reed then takes her cue from that critique of logocentrism and associates uh, the logos, the authority of a divine word with uh, male domination of women. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not in generally in my teaching to trigger warnings or anything like that, but I'm going to uh, quote from uh, her book, Indecent Theology. And this is, this is the most shocking slide that you will come across, but it, it's important to get it over just how um, how much a transgression uh, queer theology sometimes wants to indulge in with regard to classic Christian theology on sexuality. So um, you might just, if you if you don't really want to engage in in this uh, connection she makes between the word and the male phallus, then you know you can mute if you like. Um, or look away, um, it's only going to take a minute to read it. But for those with uh, strong stomachs spiritually and physically, um, let's see the sort of thing that queer theologians can sometimes move into. So she talks about um, sort of um, uh, systematic theology, particularly as done largely by men in history, as uh, focused on the highest phallus men could conceive of, the word of God. And then she speaks about how um, the uh, submission to God uh, that Christians uh, encourage is um, often something which sees that uh, word in a kind of um, uh, like um, the sexual act um, uh, and uh, how it uh, can sometimes subjugate women. And then she riffs on the idea of there being many varieties of sexual positions which systematic theology has yet not considered. So she's playing around with language as queer theologians often do, quite offensively in my view. She calls the book Indecent Theology. She does it very deliberately and provocatively, um, but it's all with a view to shaking up classic evangelical and Christian notions. Lisa Isherwood uh, talks about incarnational dynamism and fluidity. So she says, far from creating the same yesterday, today and tomorrow, 
this is always this incarnational dynamism is always propelling human beings forward to new curiosities and challenges, not shutting them off from the world, but drawing them into more and more of themselves as they spiral into the divine human dance. Drawing them into more and more of themselves. Across this forum, we will see the way in which the gospel in modern Europe is in tension with diverse philosophies and schools of thought which do focus on what uh, Richard Rorty has called the turn to the subject, the individual, self-will, self-actualization. That's what lies behind a lot of these theologies. And for Lisa Isherwood herself, to be transgressive, as Cheng puts it, is to have an I theology, as he calls it. Theology is a form of autobiography, a discourse of experiences which have been traditionally silenced in theology. Now, there's no doubt that uh, theology needs to listen to the voices of the poor and the marginalized. That's what Jesus Nazareth Manifesto is all about. But it is about the self in love for the other, love for one's neighbor. This is not quite along those lines. It's for the self being realized in the act of the will around sexuality. And it also means that as one self-actualizes, one self-actualizes in relation to reconstructing even a figure as central as Jesus himself. So for Robert Shear Goss, Jesus is reconceived as uh, potentially homosexual like he is. Um, for Althaus Reed, he's reconstructed in her will as a bisexual man, because that's her experience. And I know this seems outlandish, but this is the logical consequence of the forces and the influences that I have described. Um, it's called reading queerness back into historic models and texts by Susanna Cornwall. There is this retrospective reimagining of the gospel and of the gospel stories. Uh, around those themes. Let me give you an example of two texts which are uh, queered in queer theology. And um, these I will uh, kind of finish with, with some uh, summaries at the end, and then we can move into questions. But um, in Matthew 9, 12, Jesus speaks of there being eunuchs who've been so from birth, eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by others, and eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now that normally is taken to be uh, Jesus uh, affirming positively a single life. And indeed in commentaries along the classic evangelical track by Donald Hagner, Frederick Dale, Brunner and David Turner, that's exactly how it's construed. In Brunner's commentary, in fact, that text is uh, headed in the commentary, that pericope, the gift of the single life. But in queer theology, as propounded by folk like Megan de Franza um, and uh, Adrian Thatcher and Lee Marie Tonstadt, and in the queer Bible commentary edited by um, Darren Guest and others, um, that text is taken as a pretext uh, for um, uh, intersex conditions, which are not exactly the same, of course, as transgender identities. And Marty Nissenen even, even speculates that some of these eunuchs described by Jesus might have been homosexually oriented men who'd renounced marriage for the simple reason that it would have held little or no attraction for them anyway. But Robert Gagnon in the classic evangelical tradition pushes back against that and points out that in the cultural and religious context of the time, eunuchs for the kingdom in particular could only have implied abstinence from any sexual relationship. That was the norm. Uh, in uh, the Jewish culture of the time. And there is, as I say, a re-inscribing of history because of course, truth is constructed and identity and sexuality are reconstructed and we re-queer the biblical text if we are uh, aligning with queer theolo theology, which I wouldn't of course, but um, that's the way um, that it tends to work. Another favorite text um, of queer theologians is Matthew 22, verse 30, uh, when Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees, uh, with the Sadducees rather, about Leverite marriage, and they're trying to catch him out. They don't believe in the resurrection, but they're asking about um, uh, who will be married to whom in the case of a, a widow marrying 
um, the brother, if you like, of, 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 of the husband she's lost in the resurrection. And he says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now, this is a favorite text. You believe you me, you read, as I have queer theology, you encounter this text time and time and time again, because it looks like um, heterosexual marriage norms are relative, that they are going to be dissolved in the eschaton uh, when Jesus comes back and establishes a new kingdom, uh, uh, a new heaven and a new earth. So for both Adrian Thatcher and Megan de Franza, it becomes a pretext precisely for that, for that sense that what is to come, which is that marriage is to some degree dissolved, uh, can be proleptically, namely anticipated here and now. And actually there can be in the work of Robert Song in particular, a, um, a, an affirmation of same-sex partnerships because they go beyond that heteronormative model of marriage. But fortunately, there are refutations of that way of thinking in Ian Paul's work in a very, very good book uh, on uh, this whole area uh, from Apollos uh, called Marriage, Family and Relationships, Biblical uh, Doctrinal and Contemporary Perspectives. And Ian Paul argues it's very important that we see marriage actually is persisting as a paradigm of human relating into the eschaton. Uh, Christ and his church are conceived as a bridegroom and bride, for example. Um, there is the great wedding feast um, of the Lamb that is described there as well and anticipated actually in the very same passage in Matthew that he begins to speak about they neither marry nor are given in marriage, uh, but are like the angels. And he also goes and points out that, of course, to be like the angels uh, in that marriage is no longer the key way in which we relate, but we are related to God around the throne of glory in perfected uh, life as our sins are taken away. That is the focus, worship in all eternity, such that our marital relations on earth, by contrast, are relatively less vital. That is not the same as saying that we become like angels. And in any case, um, it could be argued that angels are gendered as well. We won't get into that. As I say, Robert Song and uh, Virginia Rami Mollencott uh, take that text nonetheless to be a pretext for um, affirming uh, gay marriage and transgender relationships. But from an evangelical perspective, Andrew Goddard pushes back in that same book and says this is a spurious uh, drawing of the future into the present and a misreading, of, uh, particularly Galatians 3.28, in Christ there is neither male nor female, which is about um, not dissolving uh, sex difference, but about entry into the church, into the kingdom of God, without prejudice to whether one is in fact a woman or a man. So just to sum up before uh, I take some questions, there are massive theological challenges in queer theology for evangelicals of the classic uh, tradition, like the folk uh, who gather at ELF, around what it means to be human, theological anthropology, um, the need to reassert that the image of God is indeed dyadic, and that that is the basis of fulfilled personhood, the relationship between male and female. More generally, there is a, a querying of what truth is and how truth is construed. Is truth given or is truth constructed by the human will? And that raises fundamental questions for us about God as such. So while it's important to engage with queer theology, it's also important to have a real sense of what it is so that it can be robustly uh, responded to uh, and critiqued, even with compassion around the folk that it purports to represent, folks who may have gender dysphoria and may be struggling with same-sex attraction and their gender identity. So I hope that this has helped to uh, kind of in a short space of time unpack some of the key themes of queer theology and the ways that evangelicals will need to respond to it.